Today on What If, we'll explore the lore of black stalking and ESL shootings in Sunnyvale, California. We'll meet a man who witnessed the day's murderous events firsthand, ESL employee Bill Lee. He had about a thousand rounds of ammunition. There were about 350 employees. He could actually shot every one of us three times over. And we'll explore what if. The laws at the times had outlawed stalking. This case led to the first anti-stalking legislation in the nation. And suggestions of what to do if you are the one being stalked. If you're the person being stalked, don't try to deal with it yourself. You know, get help, get it immediately. And what if someone with self-defense training had been armed at ESL that day? Well, I thought about it hundreds of times. It could have made a difference. All this and more on today's What If. In today's economy, people are finding themselves spending more and more time at work. So it's not surprising to find out that in a recent survey, 59% of respondents had been involved in a workplace romance at some time in their career. But what if one person's feelings of love are not reciprocated by the object of their affections and they can't take no for an answer? When romantic feelings turn to obsession, the situation can get very ugly very fast. In extreme cases, an obsession can turn to fatal violence. There are nearly 800 workplace homicides a year on average. One of the most memorable cases involved a pretty young woman named Laura Black and her co-worker turned stalker, Richard Farley. The story begins in 1984 in Sunnyvale, California, when a 36-year-old ex-Navy computer whiz and expert marksman, Richard Wade Farley, starts a new job at Electromagnetic Systems Labs, or ESL. When Farley is introduced to a pretty, petite 22-year-old named Laura Black, it was love at first sight, as he later described it. His feelings rapidly escalated into a fatal obsession. He met at ESL as co-workers. He became infatuated with Laura Black. She did nothing to solicit that infatuation. She wanted a business professional relationship. He basically became obsessed with her. Wrote letters, lots of letters, uh, left presents and gifts. ESL, their human resources department kind of kept him from doing some of those things, but once he was terminated, they no longer had any control over him. He followed her around. Uh, she moved. Uh, he discovered where she moved to and followed her there too. In those days, there was no stocking legislation. He had actually planned it out. He had sold his, his truck. He had sold a lot of his belongings to get money. He wrote bum checks, and then he used that money to buy weapons. The motor home that he brought to ESL, he intended to go there, kill her, and then kill himself. Early on the morning of February 16, 1988, ex-gang member Bill Lee is driving to work at ESL when he gets a premonition. Little does he know that his teen years spent surrounded by gang violence and weapons would aid him as the day's horrible events unfolded. I'm driving to work. I was just overwhelmed with a feeling. And it was frightening in some ways. And at the same time, it was refreshing in that I somehow knew that that day, the reason why I went to work for ESL would be apparent to me. Around 2.45 p.m., Richard Farley pulls up in his RV, armed to the teeth. He came to the building in that rented motorhome. He had also brought cans of gasoline. He talked about he intended to burn the place down. Coming up, the Placid offices at ESL are transformed into a blood-soaked killing field. There were about 350 employees that were housed in M5. He had about 1,000 rounds of ammunition on him. He could have actually shot every one of them three times over. In an RV in the parking lot of ESL in Sunnyvale, California, mass murderer Richard Farley is preparing to launch his bloodthirsty attack to get revenge on Laura Black a woman he has been relentlessly stalking for four years. Inside the building, corporate employment manager and ex-gang member Bill Lee is preparing for an interview. I got a phone call from the receptionist. My three o'clock interview was here. I thanked her and I walked to the lobby. At the other end of the building, Farley is starting his brutal attack. 
He had a semi-automatic rifle. He had a shotgun. He had multiple pistols. And he had a, a, about a thousand rounds of ammunition on him. There were about 350 employees that was housed in M5. He could actually shot every one of us three times over. His first victim was Levy. Farley shot him right away, and he died instantly. Farley entered the building. He encountered one person who was just moving into an office. He faced Farley, ran back into his office, tried to hide behind the door, and he was actually not shot. Farley proceeded down the hall and looked into another office, and that's when Buddy Wilson was working. Farley shot him, then Farley proceeded up the stairs. He just kept on firing. And he was making his way to one particular employee's office, and her name was Laura Black. Meanwhile, on the first floor, Bill is heading to the lobby with his new candidate. Due to extensive soundproofing, he has no idea that another part of the office has been transformed into a killing field. And right when I opened the door, people were running down the stairs and they were shouting, some people were crying. And I just said, what's going on? And someone said, there's a man with a gun in the building. And seconds later, the first gunshot went off. And uh, the minute I heard it, I knew it was gunfire. So I grabbed my candidate by the arm and I basically just shoved him out the door. And then I realized that there were approximately 45 co-workers of mine in the human relations department. And I didn't see a single one of them out there. There was a security guard. I said, someone needs to go in my department because my co-workers are in there. And he says, I'm sorry, but I, I can't leave the post. I said, well, let me go. And he says, no, I can't let you back in either. My instinct just came in. And I just pushed him out of the way, ran into my department, and it was surreal. Everybody was just as if nothing was going on. I ran down the corridors, and I started banging on doors, and I just said, everybody listen to me. There's an emergency. Don't panic, but you need to leave and get out of the building right away. One person was on the phone, and they were saying one minute, and I said, no, I grabbed the phone, and I said, out now. So at that point, everybody was out, and then I followed them out. As soon as there was a gunfire, people didn't realize how serious it was. Approaching the second floor, Richard Farley is nearing the woman he's been stalking for the past four years, Laura Black. She was in the office, and he shot her in the shoulder, which also collapsed her lung. She kicked the door shut on him, and he shot once more into the office, and then he made his way down, and at the end, he uh, killed uh, seven people. At around the same time, police started swarming the ESL campus, including the man who had become the chief police negotiator at ESL, Ruben Grijalva. When the first officers arrived, it was pandemonium. People were fleeing the building, running, and so forth. We entered a building right across from the building in which Farley was uh, held up in. We prepared to wait for a phone call. When the phone rang, uh, I was the closest one to the phone, and I picked it up. Grijalva. It was Richard Farley. I said, my name is Ruben, and I want to get you out of this alive. But when I first asked him to surrender, Farley stated, I'm not ready, I want to gloat for a while. Farley stated that he wanted to date Laura. He said none of this would have happened if she would have gone out with him one time. Once negotiations began, uh, our tactical SWAT team gained control of the entire first floor. He had control to the entire second floor for most of the negotiation. And we did have some 30 people still, you know, locking themselves in offices. He was very intense. He told me that this was all about a person named Laura Black and that he was due in court the next day and that he had to do something about it. Our conversation went on and off for about four and a half hours. In the end, it all came down to food because even mass murderers have to eat. He had asked for a sandwich. He asked for a Togo's number 26 sandwich and a Diet Pepsi. He was very specific how he wanted his sandwich built. It was really important to him to get this glass of Diet Pepsi with ice to chew. The, the food arrives, and I tell him, you know, your food's here now. Now we have to work on how we're going to get it to you. And he said to me, so you think I ought to surrender now? I said, yeah, I think that'd be best. For the next 20 minutes or so, we talked about his surrender. I said to him, and this was kind of a funny statement, I said, I have your Diet Pepsi here, and the ice is melting. He says, okay, I'll come out. And within two minutes of that, he walked out the building. 
a volatile situation diffused by a sandwich and a soda. But the after effects were felt long after the Pepsi was gone. I will tell you that afterwards, uh, I did walk through the building. That was tough. But when I did walk through the building following the incident and saw the, the, you know, the death and the destruction that he had caused, you know, my hands were shaking. I mean, I, I definitely felt it afterwards. Coming up, what we have learned from the Laura Black stalking. What if someone at the office that day had been armed and trained to stop a deadly threat? If you're the person being stalked, don't try to deal with it yourself. You know, get help, get it immediately. The aftermath of the ESL tragedy left seven people dead and four people wounded. And there were a lot of what ifs about how these terrible events might have been prevented or at least stopped in their tracks. What, what I hope we can take from this is that employers everywhere, whether you be in a post office situation or any situation, do training for their employees and identify a plan for how to deal with uh, potentially violent employees. And for Laura Black, what started as a workplace annoyance became a horrible four-year odyssey that ended in tragedy. Laura Black did all the right things. There, there should be no blame for her whatsoever at all. And if you're the person being stalked, uh, don't try to deal with it yourself. You know, get help, get it immediately. Talk to the police, talk to uh, a lawyer. There are still those among Laura's co-workers that day who wonder, what if one of them had been carrying a gun and had the proper training to use it? As far as whether it would have made a difference if an employee or a security guard was armed, would, would Farley have been able to stop earlier, right when he was entering the building or even right when he was walking through the parking lot? I know I've thought about it hundreds of times. It could have made a difference. If you can stop that situation yourself, you're in the right place, you're in the right time, you're prepared, you're trained, and there's a threat that's gonna be imminent threat to someone's life, then you're in a position to take, take some action. And a lot of times, just confronting those people may stop that threat. But if you aren't prepared to carry a gun, there are other things you can do to keep yourself safe in an ESL type scenario. In the ESL shooting or any occupational setting, there's a few things you can do. If you're in an office and you have an office, yeah. you could go under your desk. Another good place are stairwells. Um, stairwells provide a lot of cover because if somebody comes on one floor, you can always keep that person in your view, egressing up and down stairs. Um, that makes a big difference. Again, always try to get out of the situation. You wanna get as far away from the, the gunshot sounds as you can. Maybe it's standing on top of the toilet with the door closed in the, in the bathroom. But you want to keep your distance away from that person. The ESL incident affected many people's lives. Seven people were lost for no reason. But the one thing this terrible event did do is bring the problem of stalking into the national dialogue. This case led to the first anti-stalking legislation in the nation. For ex-gang member Bill Lee, the events at ESL were the culmination of his life's journey to that point. That was going through my whole life in order to be able to serve in that role at ESL, to save those people. ESL was truly a fatal obsession. And while it was a tragic, life-changing day for all involved, some good did come out of all the bad. The ESL shooting pressured legislators to draft new laws that outlaw stalking. And now law enforcement has the tools to help turn the tide before a workplace attraction turns into a deadly obsession. Hopefully, by examining the past, we can use the knowledge we've gained to keep events like ESL from ever happening again.